It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, T. Mark Montoya, who has many roles. So please get ready to listen to all of them. Um, and that, that, that he will bring these to his dialogue this morning. So T. Mark Montoya is an Associate Dean for Curriculum and Student Affairs at the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at Northern Arizona State University. He's a first-generation college student. He attended New Mexico State University where he received his BA in history and MA in government. He moved to Arizona to pursue a PhD in political science at Northern Arizona University, which he completed with distinction in 2009. His scholarship centers broadly on US-Mexico borderlands, borderland pedagogy, citizenship, ethnic studies, Latinx studies, DACA, hip hop, and first generation student experiences. At NAU, Montoya is most involved with the first generation learning community, the teaching academy, and the commission on ethnic diversity. He serves as president of the Association for Borderland Studies, chair of the Northern Arizona Dream Fund, and is also with me on the editorial board of the Journal of First Generation Student Success. His awards are many, and I will highlight a few. He has been NAU's President's Distinguished Teaching Fellow from 2022 to 2026, the Government Department Star of the College of Arts and Sciences at New Mexico State University, and the Victoria Foundation's Outstanding Latinx Faculty Service Teaching Representative in the Arizona Higher Education Award. He is most grateful for his partner, Katie, and their dog, Maya. We are delighted to have you here in all these roles and look forward to your comments this morning. Thank you so much, Timar. Wow, thank you so very much. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm trying to navigate a number, uh, a number of things here, but wow. Thanks uh, so much for that, that introduction. Um, hopefully uh, folks can see uh, my uh, presentation. Let's see, chats. Yes, you can see it. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Again, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to this um, uh, keynote this morning. I, I so greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I want to start off with uh, some positionality, just to let folks know who I am, although that was a, a very kind uh, introduction uh, that was given. So again, uh, T. Mark Montoya, he, him, Ed. I'm coming from the indigenous lands of what is now known as Flagstaff, Arizona, where Black Lives Matter and queer lives exist. I am recovering political scientist who teaches ethnic studies, studies the US Mexico borderlands, and writes about first-generation college experiences. Beyond any deficit models of being um, Latine, rural, working class, poor, first generation, and so on, these labels have been my strength. I am currently, again, the Associate Dean for Curriculum and Student Affairs and Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Northern Arizona University. And I am furthermore a first-generation college student. I'm actually a first-generation high school student. My, my parents did not complete high school. Um, what I'm envisioning today is a conversation with my peers. And again, I am grateful to have this opportunity today. I am grateful to Dr. Rashne Jahangir and Tara Molengraf for their invitation. I am grateful to all the organizers of today's event. And I am grateful to the students, faculty, staff, and campus service workers for your tireless work in moving this forward. So in one word, and you can uh, type this in the chat, describe the first gen experience. I'm looking at the chat right now and I'm enjoying how quick this this one word is. I'm also enjoying that what uh, I saw maybe six or seven years ago um, as the one word has shifted drastically. I think that's that's really great to to see for sure. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and please uh, continue to do so. 
So I want you to reflect on that one word. And I want you to sort of think that um, if your one word happened to be something on the more negative side, how that word might shift by the end of today's um, presentations and, and discussions that, that you'll be having here uh, as well. So there are things I think we should already know, right? So I'm not gonna give you definitions and so on of uh, first generation students and first generation student experiences. Uh, but we, we, we know these things, but I'm gonna sort of just rehash them just a little bit, right? First generation students are more likely to be students of color again, uh, experiencing higher incidence of racism. They're more likely to be of a low socioeconomic background, thus they attend uh, K to 12 schools with limited resources, and they're more likely to enroll, or they're, they enroll in and graduate from college at significantly lower rates than their continuing generation peers, but they do compromise, comprise a significant and growing percentage of university populations na nationwide, right? Again, things that we should already know. But what I want to do today is really talk about some of the things that I do and start to mesh them together with first generation uh, college experiences. Again, like I said, I'm a political scientist, I teach ethnic studies, I study the US Mexico borderlands, and I write about first generation student experiences. So I want to sort of bring in my uh, borders and borderland studies experiences. And one thing we know about borders is that they're exclusive. They're meant to be exclusive, right? Borders are manifestations of colonization, they're manifestations of imperialism, and they're manifestations of racial stratification. And I think we see that first gen and those first gen experiences can be borderlands experiences, right? So grounded in this first generation student success, success research and utilizing appropriate borderlands pedagogy, I want to draw attention to the academic border crossing experiences of first gens and the many intersections that inform their journeys. In other words, first gen itself is a borderlands experience, right? We cross multiple borders as first gen college students. We cross the border from high school to college, from the hallway to the classroom, and so on. And there are certainly questions to consider, right? And the question I want, I want you all to consider, or, or two questions I want you to consider is this. How should we talk about racism and other isms that first generation students face, right? But more importantly, how can we address these questions from a critical theory vantage point that will not be easily co-opted by liberalism or other disempowering social processes. And in order to answer that question, I need to go to my sort of, uh, and, and put on my other hat. So I, I introduced the one hat of borderland studies, and then I wanna now introduce the second hat of ethnic studies. And let's talk a little bit about ethnic studies. Ethnic studies is born out of students like you right? Student protests, blowouts, walkouts, student protests demanding ethnic studies, demanding that their stories be told in the classroom, acknowledging that they are part of history. There were strikes, and these student protests were always community-oriented. Ethnic studies also comes out of third world liberation, the third world liberation of, 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 of colonized peoples, third world liberation that was often post-colonial and very much so often anti-colonial, and again, was always community oriented. And in, in order to, to give some context, um, there's a really interesting court case that happened in 1974. This was a class action lawsuit. Um, it, it was uh, known as Cerna versus Portales Municipal Schools. I only learned about this um, when I was um, actually already a college professor. So, so, so think about this, this uh, very important landmark case that I only learned about, again, as, as a college professor. This was the first case to raise the issue of bilingual education outside the context of desegregation. So basically it was the, the next important case of, of um, talking about issues of race, racism, ethnicity, 
in public schools after Brown versus Brown versus the Board of Education. Again, this is this is 1974, not that long ago. The Portales Municipal School District served four elementary schools at the time, one junior high and one high school. A quarter of the district of Portales, New Mexico was divided by the railroad tracks, in the north side of town. And the north side of town, most Mexican Americans lived in this district. And Lindsay Elementary, which was on the north side of town, served 87% Spanish surname students. The points of view were Judy Serna, a minor, through her mother, Romana Serna, argued that the Portales Municipal Schools did not provide or take into consideration bilingual and bicultural education. They also argued that the schools failed to hire faculty of Mexican-American descent, right? And that the students were being deprived of the 14th Amendment and Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Portales Municipal Schools argued that it was not appropriate to bring the lawsuit because they were not at fault at having candidates who were not interested. The superintendent of schools argued that uh, faculty of Mexican-American descent were not hired because they didn't apply. The court found undisputed ev evidence that Spanish surname students do not reach the achievement of le levels attained by their Anglo counterparts. And the schools, Bertalas Municipal Schools were ordered to establish an educational plan to consider national origin, incorporate bilingual bicultural curriculum, restructure assessments, and employ bilingual educators as um, administrators. And here's a, a, a picture of, of young uh, Judy Serna. And why I, I tell this particular story is, is this. I'm from Portales, New Mexico, and didn't learn this until I started teaching in college, right? But at the same time, I'm an outcome of this, right? I'm an outcome of this story. Because as we know, even if the lawsuit happened in 1974, processes are really slow in changing the structure, right? So the structure isn't changed completely until 1979, when a young T. Mark McGuire goes into kindergarten. I'm the first class to be fully integrated in my hometown, 1979, that is not that long ago, right? And the other thing that, that I, I often reflect on is my brother who's 10 years older than me, isn't fully desegregated until he starts junior high in 1979, right? So again, I think this is really important to understand and how we can sort of bring in this idea of borderland studies, ethnic studies to first generation student experiences. And when I'm in, in the classroom and I teach ethnic studies courses, I start with this um, very important question. Does my race and my ethnicity matter? And I often get so many back and forth from the classroom as to whether it does or doesn't. And I ask this in the context of teaching, again, ethnic studies courses. And a lot of students will say, well, you're teaching an ethnic studies course. We've identified you as a person of color. Therefore, it matters because you can speak to a particular experience as a so-called ethnic minority. Other students will say, well, it doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter because you're a learned person who has learned things and now can teach us these things as well. I'm like, okay, these are great arguments. I don't disagree with either of them necessarily. Then I ask the students though, okay, not so much of if my race or ethnicity matter, but is it easier for me to teach these ethnic studies courses as a person that you've identified as Latino? And again, I get the, the back and forth of yes and no. And I used to think way back in the days that it was, right? I used to think that, well, I can speak from a particular experience. I can tell my stories. I can um, offer a sense of legitimacy. Until I had a conversation with a white colleague and he said, no, Mark, it's easier for me as a white guy to teach ethnic studies courses because I can go up there in front of the classroom and talk about racism, talk about uh, 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 institutionalized discrimination, talk about all the different isms that intersect with racism 
and I'm going to be taken as neutral and objective as a white man. You, on the other hand, can say the exact same thing in the exact same way, and you'll be seen as another minority complaining. And I was like, well, and I never could, could win an argument with, with Dr. O Joel Olson, who passed away uh, several years ago, sadly, at a very um, young age. And I, I think about that all the time when I'm talking about these sorts of issues and talking about the issues of race, racism, and again, other intersections of, of discrimination that exists in our world. And when I talk about this, in order to sort of unpack it a little bit, um, I, I often show this particular image of money, right? And, and I sort of compare the top $1 bill to the bottom $20 bill. And I ask students, okay, if you had these things in your wallet, in your pocket or whatever, um, the $20 bill is better because it's bigger money, right? And they think about it like, well, no, it's not. It's the same size. I'm like, okay, well, then the $20 bill is better paper, right? And they're like, no, it's, it's, you know, it's the same paper, right? I'm like, well, yes, again, here's the issue with race and racism, right? Well, biologically, folks are the same. We have socially constructed these differences and placed particular values on them, right? So that we value different groups differently, right? And we, I guess, disvalue other groups very differently as well. And this has so many implications in so, so many ways. So when we look at these levels of inequality, we see that there are so many ways to understand them, right? There are historical levels, there are institutional levels, there are ideological levels, and finally there are personal levels of inequality. The problem is, is that the focus is usually on the personal level or the so-called individual level of analysis, right? So, so, so many folks will come into my class thinking, well, racism is um, that person doesn't like that person because of their race, right? Or their ethnicity, or, or they don't like that person because of their uh, gender or sexuality or different ability and so on, right? And they fail to take into consideration ideology, institutions, and history, and how that all plays a role in these levels of inequality as well. And why I bring this up is to really, I think, talk about um, deficit narratives that often sort of build out of this, right? That particular students are, are um, I guess, uh, experiencing different crises, right? That some students, um, because of their identities, are at, at risk, right? So-called at risk. That some students are damaged or they're apathetic or they're deviant, right? And then there are so many assumed solutions, right? That we need to save them or sometimes that we need to modify them towards respectability, right? Well, if you dress this way or if you talk that way or if you do this thing in this particular way. And then I go back and think about this, this so-called assumed crises, right? That, that deviant student, the deviant student who's not really deviant, but that student who's probably might be hungry, right? That student didn't maybe have breakfast that morning, right? The, the apathetic, the so-called apathetic student who, who is brilliant beyond their years, but is, is thinking differently, right? Learns differently, right? And again, we, as we know, and I know I'm, I'm probably preaching the choir here, is that these solutions don't always work because we're already assuming that students are coming in with these uh, deficiencies and these particular deficits. So when we look at these deficit narratives, we have to ask another question, right? How does this play into how we talk with students? How do we have conversations with our students? How do we let them tell their stories? And, and this is why, I often like to tell my story, right? Because I think it's really important for them to know that even in my hometown where a major uh, civil rights law case came out of, I didn't learn about, even though I was a product of, of, of that shift, right? 
that sometimes we're told things and other times we're not. And the question then is why does this happen, right? And then again, why does this come into play with how we talk with our students? So I wanna revisit the questions I, I posed earlier. Again, how should we talk about race, racism and other isms first generation students face? And again, how can we address these questions from a critical theory van vantage point that will not be easily co-opted? The answer is borderlands pedagogy. According to Gloria Andaldua, uh, 1987, the borderlands are not only observed, they are lived, right? We live the borderlands. People live multiple borderlands, racialized borderlands, ethnic borderlands, geopolitical borderlands, language borderlands, uh, sexuality borderlands, different ability borderlands, and then sometimes we live these multiple borderlands at the exact same time. The borderlands is this idea of being bordered, right? And pedagogy is the method and practice of teaching. Again, the answer, borderlands pedagogy. So what is your story? Do you have a first gen story? I'm gonna share with you my first gen story. My freshman year, I was to meet with my advisor. Um, I was a history major. I, my advisor was a, and I, I'm sure he was a young man, but in my eyes as an 18 year old was, a, was an old gray history professor with the big sideburns, wore the glasses down the nose, wore the patches on the elbows of, of his jacket and was probably the scariest man alive. And I had no idea about the concept of office hours. I thought uh, college professors and, and, and all the college professors here are probably gonna laugh at me a little bit and be like, oh yeah, me too. Um, I thought uh, college professors worked a regular eight to five job. I didn't take into consideration teaching, research, service, and so on. So one morning when I'm supposed to um, get my advising uh, documents signed and, and uh, uh, hashed out, I went to his office. I woke up early that morning um, and knocked on his office door at 8.01 a.m. Knock, knock, knock. No answer. All right, that's fine. Wait around. Okay. Walked around the building, went back, 8.15. No. Nine o'clock. No. 10 o'clock. No. Finally, I'm getting nervous and frustrated. And I got brave and went to the history department office, whereupon the woman sitting behind the desk, the admin associate of, of the history department, said, Mijo, and for those of you who don't speak Spanish, you know, son, Mijo, did you not look at his door? <laughs> and I'm like, I was standing by his door most of the morning. Like, did you not see that he has office hours? And I'm like, uh, I wasn't paying attention. I just wanted to get, you know, the, this uh, paperwork signed. And she's like, okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, he, he's not around today, but what um, I, I can have you do is that you can, um, you can talk to the chair. And my response was, well, but I'd like to talk to a person because again, I had no idea what a chair was. So think about this, right? I think most folks do have a first gen story, right? And it, and it probably um, is about not understanding how to navigate the academy, maybe a story about feeling lost, maybe a, a story about not um, being in the right, at right place at the right time. Again, an, another story I have is that I had to go to the business office, which is basically, basically the bursar, to um, take care of, of some financial issues. And I went to the business college, right? The college of business. Because that, there's business, right? Is that, is that not it? And again, so, so I want you to sort of think about that story, think about that first gen story and how that story that may have made you feel bad at the time that it happened is the exact story that empowers you today, right? The exact story that helps you today. 
and that exact story that helps you help other people today as well. And then I also have a border story, right? The story of, of my first crossing of the US-Mexico border. So a lot of folks that are um, uh, of, of, of Mexican descent, Mexican-American, Chicano, Latino, however they wanna identify themselves, might have crossed the border on day one. I didn't cross the border until I was 17 years old from El Paso, Texas to Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. And before I crossed the border as a 17 year old, I really thought I was going to be transformed by crossing the border into Mexico, right? That I was going to be um, going home, right? I'm gonna go home to Mexico, my homeland, right? That um, I was gonna be greeted by mariachis. Like once I stepped over that line, just all of a sudden, right? And it didn't happen. Instead, I was uh, greeted by a little kid selling chicles, selling gum. And it was heartbreaking, right? And then after spending the day in, in, in Ciudad Juarez, when I crossed back into the United States, I was like, am I home now? So the question then is, why did I not feel at home in Mexico? And why did I not feel home in the United States? And I think what's interesting about Mexican Americans and other sort of other hyphen Americans is that idea of navigating that hyphen, right? Navigating the hyphen between the United States and Mexico or, or the hyphen between whatever other hyphen American. And I, I, I jokingly have this uh, photo here of the US-Canada border, because that's, again, not the border I crossed. And as you can see, it literally is a line in, in, in the, um, on the road. It's not that border that I'm talking about or that line, it's this line. This line. This line. This line. And you see the difference there, right? That borders exist to exclude people, right? That we create borders in the academy to exclude people. Sometimes the borders are nice and simple and clean, and often they're not. Therefore, the classroom should not exist in isolation. It needs to be connected to our lived experiences. So in understanding borderlands, we must look at the rules of citizenship. What are the rules of citizenship? This is known as the citizenship regime, right? And there are various rules that make citizens. There's the membership rules, right? I'm a member. I belong. There's the us and there's the them, right? We belong, they don't. There are rights and entitlements, right? You get rights and you get entitlements from particular nation states. And then there are social expectations and responsibilities. Well, we're given rights, we also are expected to do things, right? To be so-called good citizens. And finally, the last aspect of the citizenship regime are physical borders, right? The things that, that separate us from other groups of people. So the argument here is that the citizenship regime deals primarily in power. And those who have the power to define citizenship are generally the same as those who have the power to claim citizenship, right? And, and here's where a lot of the citizenship scholars don't like my, my research, which is absolutely fine, is because they're like, well, you're muddying up terms. And I'm like, yes, that's absolutely what's happening, right? There are citizens and there are non-citizens. And then within a particular citizenship regime, there are, are so-called first-class citizens and second-class citizens, third, et cetera, and so on. So 
The issue then is citizenship is not a neutral concept. We often, often overlook the ways in which citizenship is constructed. And more importantly, we often overlook who gets to construct citizenship. So when we link power to citizenship, we see that our various intersections all factor into who's granted full citizenship rights and who is not, right? Again, our various intersections all factor into this. You are not a full citizen because of this or that, right? Skin color, sexuality, race, class, so on, so forth. So I want to introduce to you a new term, a, a term that, that I came up with about now maybe 15, maybe longer years ago, uh, a concept known as borderdom. So it, it, it's a, definitely a play on words, boredom, but, but hopefully none of this is, is boring, um, borderdom. And, and, it play, it, and it, it sort of takes into consideration various concepts, right? So we've talked about borders, that line that surrounds and separates particular areas which are different from border lands, which are vague, indefinite, outlying, transitionary. The suffix dumb is a realm of jurisdiction, like a kingdom or a state of being, such as freedom. So border them, I conceptualize as both the realm of jurisdiction at or near a borderland and as the condition of being bordered. So we see various themes then, right? Citizenship regime is becoming more politicized and more in institutionalized. Human communities are defining themselves and others according to their borders. Citizenship is more than a restrictive category and border them, borderdom therefore shows how individuals can and should negotiate physical barriers as well as confront the symbolic meanings of borders. I'm pausing on purpose, by the way, because when I show this map to conceptualize border, borderdom to my students, I always get that one student who raises their hand and, and says, hey, your map's upside down. And I'm like, is it? Right? But what, it, what um, is our brain trying to do, right? When we look at this particular image of the US-Mexico borderland, Right? I, I, I feel oftentimes our brain is trying to flip it back to make it right. See where I'm getting at here? I'm not suggesting, however, that all we need to do is just flip everything on its head, right? We don't, we don't live in a, in a dualistic binary system. Again, things are much more complex. But I think this illustrates this idea that when we introduce new, top, two, new, co new concepts, new topics, new ways of thinking, People want to make it right again, right? No, well, let's fix it. Let's do it the way it always has been done. And it really, you know, affects us to, to a large degree to understand how we can rethink who we are, rethink our lives, rethink the institutional structural issues that happen in the academy. And the problem of the citizenship regime is that it generally ignores cultural identity and political mobilization as forms of citizenship. And it also remains a political strategy used to validate, strengthen, and reinforce racial and other hierarchies. So borderlands pedagogy must take up the task of not only creating new objects of knowledge, but also addressing how inequalities, power, and human suffering are rooted in basic institutional structures. As such, educators, all of us here, all of us are educators because we're all learning together, should prepare learners, our co, you know, our co-learners as citizens, as citizens, right? We should prepare students as citizens. And why should we do this? Because I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with my beautiful state of, of Arizona in, uh, in, uh, geez, it's already been a while. In uh, uh, 2010, the uh, Arizona State Legislature uh, passed House Bill 2281. House Bill 2281 banned ethnic studies in K through 12 in Arizona public schools. 
it effectively really banned the Mexican American studies program in the Tucson Unified School District. Um, and, and this slide isn't meant because it's in all caps to, to shout at you. <laughs> it's, it's actually uh, copied and pasted from the actual um, bill that was passed um, uh, more than a decade, de decade ago. I, I just want you to sort of read this and, and sort of take this in as well, right? A banning of, of classes, which were assumed, right? The Mexican American Studies Program in Tucson Unified School District to promote the overthrow of the United States government, from, uh, promoting resentment toward a race or class of people, designed primarily for pupils of a particular ethnic group and advocating ethnic solidarity instead of treatment of pupils as individuals, right? It was challenged, it was thrown out, but the Mexican American Studies program in the Tucson Unified School District hasn't fully recovered since it was originally banned. And now it's sort of changed to sort of culturally competent um, uh, classroom experiences for students. Again, none of these things were happening in the classroom, but that's what the, cit the citizenship regime does. It creates differences, right? It creates different classes of people. And why is this important? Because there are very important data implications in Arizona state constitutions, right? Here I have um, uh, an, an old slide, and I need to find the date for this again. I don't have it memorized. Is um, the, the population of white and Anglo folks in Arizona, African American, Mexican American, Native American, uh, the, the bright turquoise color is the population. The green color is the DOC or Department of Corrections, i.e. prisons and jails, and the red are universities. So in a, so, in a so-called ideal society, we should see that the white Anglo population of, um, you know, of, of folks in um, Department of Corrections and in um, universities ought to be at 57%, right? And, and so on. But what we're seeing here is that we have a higher instance of African-Americans in prisons and jails than the overall population. And, and um, same within universities. Of Mexican-Americans, more Mexican-Americans in um, Department of Corrections and less in uh, colleges and universities and so on. And why is this important? Because of this particular graph. The Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex, Chicane um, educational pi pipeline. Let's say, for example, you have 100 students of Mexican descent, Mexican American, and they all go to elementary school. That's good. But the numbers show us that only 46 of them will graduate from high school. Of those 46, only 26 will enroll in college. Some will go to community college, some will go to a four-year college. Of those 26 that did enroll in college, eight will graduate with a bachelor's degree. Of those eight, two will go on to earn a graduate or professional degree. And of those two, point two will graduate with a doctoral degree. So as my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Michelle Tejas at the University of Arizona always tells me, we don't count as a full person, right? We need like another hundred of us in order to, to, to do that. And this becomes important to these conversations, right? That um, CERNA versus Portales Municipal Schools changed my trajectory even though by the time I got to high school and in college and until I started teaching, I did not learn about that particular important landmark case. Then I hear folks, well, well let's reform the system. But the problem with reform is that we need to deal with the systemic issues of college citizenship and hence of isms, right? There are, are huge systemic institutional issues. And this is what makes things difficult. But we are on track right now, right? This is why we are here today to talk about these systemic and institutional issues. So when we revisit this concept of borderdom, 
we see that borderlands pedagogy lends itself to the conscious decolonization of academia and consequently the decolonization of citizenship. And, and really what I, what I mean to say here is the decolonization of the citizenship regime, right? It's the problem of the regime, right? That we can be full citizenships when we are active, when we challenge a citizenship regime, that when we look at things of, of membership versus belonging, right? I might not be a member, but I belong. So in order to sort of um, wrap this up a, a little bit, I, I wanna offer some suggestions. And, and this first suggestion is for the institutions themselves, right? Do not fear the opportunity to do better. I, I, I'm grateful for um, the, the Dean's remarks this morning because I, I see that as, as an administrator and I'm an administrator now too, which is really weird to me uh, as an associate Dean, to do better, right? We're not fearing that opportunity to do better. We are doing better. And the suggestions for, for everyone else is we might have knowledge, but knowledge is not understanding, right? So we need to understand the issues, not just know the issues. But then once we understand, understanding is not action. In other words, we need to do something, right? And finally, we have to know that access is not success, right? So while we're giving folks opportunities and access to things, we need to make sure that we're underlying their and supporting their success. So first gen as existence. When we talk about first generation experiences, this should, should not start in high school or college, but before, right? First gen experiences goes beyond or it adds to existing curricular structures. And first gen programming is not remediation for so-called at risk, right? Because none of us are at risk. We come with our strengths. We come with, with our stories, our backgrounds, our identities. And first gen as resistance, right? First gen, folks have multiple levels of knowledge, right? While it may, while we may have our first gen story that we talked about, that has made us the stronger person. It has made us understand how we can navigate the system in various ways. And how do we do that? We tell our story. We find um, the Dr. Rashnays, the Terra's the, the uh, um, deans and so on, who will tell their stories as well, right? We're in this together, we really are. So some concluding thoughts, what we need, and this is gonna be the most difficult thing is institutional buy-in, right? But again, we're seeing this, seeing this at, at, um, at Minnesota, we're seeing this here at Northern Arizona, right? We need faculty buy-in. And certainly we need structural and institutional changes. How that happens is with you all, right? You share your story, you tell your story, you identify in the way you identify and you take up space. So I want to um, thank you all today for having me um, speak with you all. This is such an honor and, 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 and um, such a privilege to be able to do this as well. And I, I do see there's a number of things in the chat. I don't know if they're still the one word or other um, things there as well, but I think, and, and Tara, you can um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there's some time for some Q&A. Great, awesome. So, uh, and, and again, I, I think because this is a webinar style that folks who might have any questions uh, would need to type that in the chat or if folks who are on the screen, the, the um, four of you that I can see um, might be able to ask questions as well. But again, thank you um, so very much. And I'll uh, open up the chat as well so I can see anything that's been happening. And I'm not sure where we're at on time. So um, please let me know as well. 
Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Montoya. Um, yeah, we can start with just looking through the chat and if anyone has any questions or comments um, that they wanna enter in um, or questions for Dr. Montoya, then we will uh, facilitate that through the chat. Mark, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the ways in which in your own work you have engaged in pushing against the structural systems that you've talked about? I think having some examples would really be powerful for folks to hear from the smallest to bigger ones because you've played many roles. Yes, ab absolutely. And that's, that's a, a great, great question. And by the way, a little insight whenever uh, a speaker says, that's a great question, they don't have the answer to it. So that's a great question. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I have a, a little bit of an answer. Um, on sort of the, the academic side, um, if, if you would have told me that ac academia required me being a writer, I probably wouldn't have even considered it. Like, you know, writing papers was like the worst thing in, in, in my process of, uh, as an undergrad student. And, and so in sort of the academic publishing era, I tell my story, I force my story into um, the sort of traditional academic writing. This is why I, I love and always cite Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, I, I think I was very fortunate when I started my undergraduate career at New Mexico State University to be taught by Chicana feminists. My, my, uh, my first day of my English class, we were all, um, asked to uh, introduce ourselves and talk about what final project we wanted to work on. And I'm like, this is the first day of class. What do you mean final project? And people had it, I thought they did anyway. They had it together. They were bubbly and, and excited and so on. And I introduced myself. I'm like, I think I'm interested in culture. And then the next class, the um, uh, professor of the, of the English class, she said, uh, hey, Mark, this is a book I think you might be interested in reading if you're interested in, in sort of concepts of culture. And the book she gave me is This Bridge Called My Back. What, what, and and I, I hope most folks don't. If you don't, uh, go ahead and Google it, which subtitle is um, uh, Feminist, Feminism by Women of Color, something along um, those lines as well. So I was introduced to women of color feminism day one as, as a college student, which meant then that I was being encouraged day one to start dismantling those systems, right? To, to start thinking differently. I got the critique before I got the, the sort of um, uh, nationalism that often occurred within Chicano studies, right? Chicano studies, you know, had, had a very nationalistic um, male focused bent and I get the critique first, right? I, I, I didn't get the sort of, here's, you know, Chicanismo, and then here, and then also women existed, let's stir them in, and, and queer folks existed, let's stir them in. So I'm like, no, I get the critique first. And I don't know if that's answering the question, but I, I think what, what, what I'm getting at here is that it starts with folks like them in the early 90s telling me, you can already start to challenge this system. You can start to, to break down um, those barriers. You can start to consider these sorts of instances because you have a story to tell and you, you have particular experiences that come around this, right? I, at, at Northern Arizona University, I've been everything that there can be, if that makes sense. I've been a student, a student worker, uh, adjunct professor, a non-tenure track professor, converted to uh, a, a tenure line, a tenured professor, uh, a chair of a, of a, de of a department, um, now an administrator. Mm -hmm. And often, if you, if you remembered, I didn't um, only acknowledge the faculty and staff, but campus uh, service workers, you know, somebody who always reminds folks to, uh, 
you know, pick up after yourself. And let's not forget that the folks who um, serve us on campus, the custodians, the uh, food folks and so on are us as well. You know, they're, they're sometimes more us than, than we, we know. And, and I think really acknowledging that and telling those stories and, and reminding folks that we're again in this together I think that really starts to shine light on what the academy is, right? There, there, there's a story, I don't know if it, it's true or not, or, or urban legend, that um, when uh, John F. Kennedy went to NASA, um, he ran into the custodian, the janitor of, of the building he was in, and he asked him, um, so what do you do here? And his response was, I'm helping to send a man to the moon, right? And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what's happening here, right? That, that you're the person in, standing in front of you in the classroom, the person who is um, doing policy, and the person who's cleaning up after us are all educating us. They all have the common purpose to serve us as learners. Right? And I think your comment, Mark, speaks to the fact that if you're lucky and you have somebody like that in a first year, first year experience, it can change things, but that can also be built in intentionally into first year programming mm -hmm. and curriculum, into classes and to things like that in, in terms of very intentional design. Um, mm -hmm. There are a couple more questions that are popping up in the chat that I wanna make sure we have a chance to um, speak to. Um, one is um, uh, uh, related to mentoring. Uh, Lewis um, asked, is there somebody outside of your family, perhaps school, who you feel was a mentor? So perhaps beyond this first year experience that you've talked about and how did that experience help you? Could you speak to that mm -hmm. a little bit? Yeah, so, so again, someone outside my family, and, and, and I, if I understand correctly, somebody within the system that I felt was a, was a, was a mentor. I mean, I, I, again, I, I've had so many mentors and, and sometimes mentors that didn't know they were my mentor, if that, if that makes sense. So when, when I found I was learning and, and understanding things, I, I would sit and, and, and reflect and think back, that's how I want to do it, right? You know, um, I, 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 I have a, a, a chapter that'll be coming out soon. And I, and I tell the story of basically following around some of my um, professors at events, right? Like they would say, hey, go to this event tonight for extra credit and so on. And then they would be there and I would see them taking notes. I'm like, oh, I better take notes. And I'd see them nodding and like, I'd start nodding. And, and, and it was just like, I was almost mimicking like, you know, like a, like a parrot or a little duckling following my, my um, professors around. But it's, it's sometimes those sorts of things, like how would I want to pattern myself? How am I learning? Oh, this is not working for me. That's not how I want to do it. This is how I, I want to do it. But, it, but at the same time, it, it was getting the encouragement of, of folks as an undergrad. Uh, as, as an undergrad, again, I, I mentioned I was a history major, but I didn't minor in anything. But if, there, if I had minored in something, it was probably very likely Latin American studies and uh, Chicano studies, because those were the, the sort of electives that I chose to, to, to um, study. And the reason why is because those were home to me, right? They made sense to me. And, and so, so it, it really, I think, changed that particular trajectory to see somebody like me, to see somebody who would tell their story. And again, and, and the, the idea that there were hidden mentors. So for, for those of you um, who might be in, in, in a newer process of learning, like if you're, you're, you're still in a student role, and again, I think we're all, all students here uh, as well, is you know, be aware that the other folks are maybe watching you and learning from you in ways that you might not know um, they're, you're, you're doing, right? So it, it's, it's being present but also being human, right? We, we sometimes stumble, we sometimes um, uh, fall back, but we, I think, are still moving forward, even if it's at a snail's pace, as long as it's forward moving and deliberate. Thanks, uh, T. Mark. There's one more question here that also has a connection around faculty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Michael James Cloud asks, what is your insight on first-generation students' interaction with faculty? Is there a mm -hmm. likelihood that first-gen students have more sub uh, substantial degree persistence, especially among minorities who are first-generation students? 
So I think the question pertains to what mm -hmm. have you seen around the benefits of um, first gen interaction with faculty members? So, so some of the benefits I've seen is that when, um, at least here at, at Northern Arizona University, is this idea that um, once we started claiming that first gen identity, it's sort of exploded, right? That folks are like, oh yeah, I was first gen and I didn't think about this. And the reason I didn't think about this because we didn't have first gen programs to 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 sort of help us navigate the system and and same with me I was always a a Pi student and people are like all oh, Pi my my grade point average is three point one four so I was always just right there above whatever people at the time would have thought like so called at risk right so so regardless of whatever I fit I um um uh, I I think start started to see it in that that particular way so so I think that there's a lot of agency in how um, faculty, staff, um, uh, campus service workers, et cetera, can interact with students to, again, create um, a larger sense of belonging. Now, now belonging itself is, is complex, right? Because folks might be able to belong to the First Gen Center or the Multicultural Center or this group or that group, and then they enter the classroom and they lose that sense of belonging, right? So again, it, it's so much more um, complex than it is than it is simple, but at the same time, it's a sort of idea of um, again telling our stories and and letting folks know that we're we're not as different sometimes than we think we are when it comes to some experiences, particularly in and within the academy. I, I the only example I can think of is um, I would have had the honor and privilege a couple of weeks ago to Montreal, to go to Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada, never been to Canada before, um, and and do a keynote on a, a borderland studies. And I had a conversation with the um, young folks who were tabling and, and registering folks and so on. And, you know, they, they're talking about how they're excited to hear my keynote. And I kept on telling them, um, you know, I'm nervous. And, you know, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not, I don't know French, and I'm gonna butcher all these sorts of things. And then afterwards, to to hear one of them said say that, um, what I remember from from your talk was not your talk, your pre-talk. You're telling me that you were nervous, and I'm like, I would thought I was the only one that was nervous, and I was so nervous that I couldn't speak English very well because I'm a French speaker, and so on and so forth. So it again, it it's it's being a human being with other human beings. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for demonstrating that so beautifully this morning, um, and also for raising questions about how belonging and belongingness on campus um, is disparate depending on where mm. people walk and where they situate themselves. Um, really grateful to you for your comments, for the theoretical frameworks, for the heart um, and the intellect and your own narrative here. I want to give um, you a big, big hooray and round of applause um, and allow Tara to say some words about us transitioning into the rest of the conference today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you.